All right, I'm going to get started, and if people come in, then they'll find a seat and meet us halfway through. Um, welcome, everybody. This is uh, my talk about taking the plunge and becoming a contributor. Um, my name is Alex Ross. I'm a senior architect at NBC Universal. Um, and on the various channels on the internet, I'm Bleen or Bleen18, so you can find me on all the, all the various places. Um, I tend to talk really loud, so if it gets too loud because of the speakers, let me know and I'll move the mic. I can't tell how loud it is back there, or if you can't hear me at all. Um, so, basically, before I got started um, contributing, I was doing what most people are doing and using Drupal and getting what I can out of it, not doing anything um, to kind of contribute back to the community. I was using a bunch of modules, I was using a base theme, I was doing all these things. I would you know, search around when I had questions or problems, um, but I was never doing anything kind of um, uh, to get back. So like most people, it started when I found a bug, right? That's usually the first place that people end up contributing. Um, and you know, I submitted a bug report, I tried to fix it, that didn't go so well. Um, I talked to a couple people in the community and, and uh, you know, eventually I got to the point where I was able to get some help and get some guidance um, from some of the community, community members who were around at the time. Um, and I finally got uh, a, a fix in place and I submitted a patch and it was accepted into Drupal core and it was very exciting. Um, and actually this is the, the comment from that original post. So I don't know if you can read it, but I was very excited about my first patch getting in and Webchick was threatening to go get Jello and Feathers and then whistled innocently. Um, so yeah, this was about four, five, four years ago. And since then, um, I've become the maintainer of uh, about a dozen modules on Drupal.org. I've contributed patches back to um, Core and to a bunch of contrib modules. Uh, and I've written documentation, I've submitted bugs, I've submitted feature requests, I've answered questions, I've been a mentor, I've done trainings, uh, I've started um, kind of mentor -y type activities at the local Drupal user group um, in New York. So I've done all of these things and I figured this was a good opportunity to talk about those things and talk about how you can kind of give back to the Drupal community and, and get involved. So I'm gonna get started uh, with how you can contribute. So uh, these are some of the ways, these are not all the ways, but they're most of them, that you can actually give back to the Drupal community and become a more active member, uh, become a contributor. And I'm gonna be going over each of these in, in pretty good detail. Uh, some of them are much easier to explain and talk about than others, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're easier to do. Uh, but as we go through, you'll see uh, what I'm talking about. So the most common way that people think of uh, when they're, they're talking about contributing to Drupal is just by um, you know, writing a bit of code, making a patch, fixing a bug, creating a new feature, submitting that patch back to the contrib module or to drupal.org. So we're gonna talk about that. We're actually gonna do it um, by the end of the presentation. Um, writing and maintaining your own contrib module. Um, some contrib modules out there are very, very small and very easy to maintain. Some of them are panels, right? Huge, complex beasts that require, you know, 10 people to kind of really get together and, and, and deal with. Uh, so we're gonna talk about how you can actually go about contributing your module and your code back to core, uh, back to the con community, rather. Uh, we're gonna talk about how to review patches, right? Um, if you come across a patch that, hey, it's been useful for you, talk about that. Go back on the issue and say, hey, I, I used this patch, it worked for me, or I used this patch and it totally screwed up everything and you should never use it. Um, both of those pieces of information are equally important to the person who's either maintaining the module or the core maintainer. Uh, if the patch works, that's great information. If it doesn't work, that means that there's more work to be done, but now we have another, you know, another data point to work off of. Mentoring someone. Right? This is a great way to contribute to the community. Um, on Friday, and I'll talk about this a little more, there's a whole big sprint for, uh, for newbies and people who are just getting started contributing, and there will be a whole bunch of people in, I don't know what color t-shirt it is yet, because I haven't picked it up, but in a yellow, uh, yellow t-shirt, who will be there you know, mentoring others and, and helping you get started as a contributor in one way or another. Um, triaging issues, all right? Not the most sexy of contrib contributions you can, you can do here, but very, very important. There are hundreds of new issues on Drupal.org every day, and some of them are duplicates, some of them are triplicates, some of them are, you know, are, uh, are totally uh, in the wrong project and just need to be moved. Some of them need to be confirmed and so on. So we're gonna talk about that. 
Uh, submitting a bug report and a feature request, right? How do we actually do that properly? And by properly, I don't mean what form do you go to. I mean, there are kind of right ways and wrong ways. Um, I'll talk about, for example, why it's not a good idea to submit a bug report by saying, wow, your code is broken. You guys suck. Why haven't you fixed it yet? Right? Things of that nature. Um, and then something as, as uh, straightforward as summarizing an issue, hugely important. There's been an initiative for a couple, I guess a year and a half now, um, to start going through and summarizing issues on Drupal.org, especially for core. Um, some of those issues can get really long and, and nasty to try and figure out and try and grok. So just you know, contributing that way can be a great way to get started. Um, and then finally, writing documentation. Everybody always talks about document everything, document everything, and that's true. We want to document everything, but there are, again, you know, different ways of doing that within the Drupal community, and each of them are valid in their own way, and we're going to talk about kind of how, um, how you can go about contributing by writing documentation. So that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to start with writing documentation. These basically go in order of ease of explanation, not in ease of doing, uh, which I mentioned before. So writing documentation, the first thing I like to remind people, whatever form your documentation takes and wherever you're writing it, and we'll talk about those, um, always assume that whatever code you're writing documentation for is, or whatever, whatever process you're writing documentation for, assume you're going to need to do it again in about two years when you're drunk. If you assume those things, right, then you will always write good documentation because you will always need to, you know, you'll always kind of uh, picture it as, as though you're going through this again for the first time because nobody can look at code two years later when they're drunk and understand what in the world they were doing with, without good documentation. Um, so on Drupal.org, um, there's a good amount of documentation up there and uh, we're gonna go take a look at that and actually you know, play around with it a little bit. Um, if, if you're following along with documentation on Drupal.org and you see something wrong, fix it right there, right then. If you see something needs clarification, fix it right there, right then. Um, if you get into the habit of doing that over time, if everybody gets in the habit of doing that over time, the documentation on Drupal.org um, and in other places, which we'll talk about, is gonna get better and better. Um, so another point that I like to bring up if there's no documentation already for the thing you're doing, whatever that thing is, write it down as you go, right? It, it, you can take out an old-fashioned pen and piece of paper. Believe it or not, they still work. But write it down as you go. These are the steps I took. This is what I clicked on. This is, what I, um, this is the wrong path I went down, right? Those are good for par parentheticals saying, don't do this, even though you may think you should. Um, all that is really good information. And if you can add it to the documentation, uh, that's going to be hugely helpful to the next person that comes along. And don't forget, that next person might be you in two years when you're drunk. So let's do that real quick. Um, I don't know if the internet is working right now, so I have it, whoops, I have a backup plan if it isn't. Uh, da -da -da. Where'd that link go? It won't let me click on my link. Oh well. Um, so I'll bring up my backup plan here. So documentation, there are a couple ways to document What's going on? There's documentation in code, right? If you're actually sitting and writing code, document your code, right? Wherever you're doing it. There's documentation on Drupal.org, which is what we're going to talk about mostly right now, and there's documentation um, that can happen in your in your blog, right? On your personal site, wherever. So documentation on Drupal.org. If you come here, close that. Uh, there's a documentation link right up at the top. Brings you a page just like this, and if you click around one of the areas that the documentation uh, breaks it down into, and you might, you, in all likelihood, you'll get to one of these pages based on a Google search anyway, but if you get to one of these pages, for example, working with nodes and content types, right, and you see something that is incorrect, right, you, as long as you log into Drupal.org, you can edit it right away, right here. There is no uh, requirement to, um, you know, to have permission to edit the documentation. All you need is a Drupal.org account. That's it. So log in head into here, say, hey, this documentation is only appropriate for Drupal 7, or it's a beginner, or all this good stuff, and then there's the actual documentation down at the bottom. Very often, as I'm going through a process, I have this page open in another tab, and I just go through and I write my documentation. <laughs> Hugely important, okay? So that is documentation. I'm gonna keep going. So the next thing I wanna talk about is summarizing issues. All right, like I said, there's been a, an initiative for, for a little while now um, for summarizing issues. Again, all you need to do this is a Drupal.org account, so it's not, there's a very low barrier to entry in terms of getting involved. 
When you're summarizing an issue, we want to summarize everything in that issue, right? This is a deceptively simple process. You know, people think, oh, summarizing issue. I have two free minutes. I can go and summarize that issue. It almost never takes that long. It almost always takes, you know, half an hour or longer. Because um, what you need to do is really understand, um, you know, the entirety of the issue. And if the issue is at a point where it needs summary, uh, chances are there's a lot going on. So let's take a quick look at, at an example of why this is really useful. Um, there was an issue um, in 2008 that I remembered very vividly, and I wanted to bring that up. This issue, if I scroll down long enough, has, I'm not going to go all the way down, it has about 600, uh, 500 comments, um, and it was about, there's a, there's a really, really horrible, annoying IE, IE bug, I know, an IE bug, um, where you can't have more than 31 style sheets on a page. It'll just ignore the 32nd and on. Like, it won't tell you, it won't throw an error, it just ignores it, and suddenly you add one more module and your entire site explodes for no good reason. So uh, we needed to figure out a way to deal with it. I'm not going to go into the details of how we did, but looking through these comments, if you were to come into this conversation on, I don't know, let's say January 6, 2010, and someone was going to say to you, hey, what's going on in that issue? Do you know how to fix the problem? There is no way you would be able to figure out what in the world was going on. And if we scroll all the way back up, and I'm not going to scroll. I will use my little magic scroll bar here. Um, all that's really in here is, hey, IE breaks when you add, you know, 31, more than 31 style sheets. Here's a link to Microsoft. That's it, right? So grokking this issue, to, and it, this is why I remember it. So it took me like a day and a half to really understand that the, the path people were taking, because um, a lot of people were arguing back and forth. So an issue summary, right? This is why they're so important. It would be, it was nearly impossible to figure out what was going on here. So here's an example of a more recent issue from last year, end of last year, where they did go through and, um, and I don't know whether this was the person who initially opened the issue or this is someone who went back and did it, but they actually went through and they did an issue summary for this. And just to give you an idea of how much easier this makes life, what's the problem? Okay, when you use the CK editor uh, in Drupal 8, uh, there's no accessible way to move around the buttons. That's really the issue. Um, and here's some screenshots that show, hey, look, no toolbar. I can't move around the button. That's a problem for accessibility. What's the proposed resolution? Hey, we need a drag and drop uh, uh, click UI. Or the, the drag and drop click UI should be driven from an HTML form, which underlies it, so that you know, someone using accessibility software can, can uh, take advantage of the form instead of the actual dragging and dropping. OK, there's a proposed resolution. What tasks are remaining? Determine a solid implementation, and so on. So the, the, the key points here are, um, remaining tasks, uh, what do we have? The problem, proposed resolution, remaining tasks, uh, whether there's any user interface changes or API changes, and then the original post. We always like to keep the original post so that when the person who originally posted it comes back later and says, ah, this wasn't the issue I was talking about, we can refer back and, and figure out what went on there. Um, so hugely important to do these, and I don't know if this is the right one. Yes, there is even a node on Drupal.org which has a template for these issue summaries. Yes. Sure, it, it's definitely, so the question was, is this relevant for closed tickets? I would argue that in the perfect world, it would already have been summarized before it was closed, but um, in reality, if a ticket does get closed, an issue, you know, for whatever reason, whether it was nonsensical or it just, you know, the, the community decided to go away, go another way, or it got pulled in, um, it's really definitely useful um, to have that summary in there, but ideally it would be there in there ahead of time. Uh, some issues are so small and so straightforward that the summary just never happens for them, but in those cases, you know, that's fine. Um, okay, so that's, that's basic, you know, imi uh, image, issue summaries, and let's go back to this guy. So I showed you an example of why this is useful and how this is done well. Um, Again, these can take a long time because grokking that issue could take you quite a while, but once you've done it, it makes the lives of the people who are actually doing the code, uh, and that might be you also, a lot easier. Um, and finally, that's the link to, uh, to the standards that have been kind of set up so that you can just copy and paste the template and, and start adding the summary. Um, the next thing, and in my opinion, this is absolutely a way of being a contributor to Drupal, um, and it's, for most people, it's the, the first way they contribute to an open source project. 
Um, my project stopped working, I don't know why, right? I file a support ticket, file a bug. Um, these things are, you know, they're very valuable. If nobody ever files the bug, if everyone assumes that someone else is gonna file the bug, then bugs don't, you know, get fixed. So huge, huge value for everybody. Um, but a couple things to keep in mind when you're, when you're you know, submitting a bug report is always ask yourself, is this a bug report or is this a support request, right? There's a very uh, grayish line um, when people are, are deciding that. A bug report, uh, a good rule of thumb to keep in mind with a bug report is if you are in, let's say it's Drupal 7 and the views module. Um, start with a vanilla install of Drupal 7 with just the views module and see if you can, can you know, still, um, uh, re reproduce, replicate the, the issue that you're seeing. And if you can, doesn't necessarily mean it, but chances are this is a bug report. Um, this is a bug and you're gonna wanna file it that way. Um, but uh, if what you're asking is really, hey, how do I do this? That's not a bug report, that's a support request. If it's, hey, it would be great if your module also did X, that's not a bug, request, you know, a bug report, that's a feature request. So it, categorizing those well uh, helps the maintainers of the module or core um, uh, figure, you know, help you, basically. Um, be as detailed as possible. You know, if you can do an issue summary right at the beginning, that's great. We will, everyone will always go back and refine those issue summaries as we go, but, you know, definitely worth um, taking the time and trying to, to start out with an issue summary. Um, finally, don't be angry. The worst possible thing you can do when you submit a bug report, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, is say, your code sucks, fix it. Right? No one wants to help out with that, especially people who are working in an open source project and volunteering their time to do so. Um, so be, be respectful of, uh, of the people who are gonna be helping you out and helping you, know, uh, you get your problem solved. So let's go ahead and just take a quick look at the, the way to submit a bug report on dribble.org. Um, did I miss it? No, I didn't. Question. Yes. How about writing a test? Uh, so writing tests is, um, is your question like, should we write tests? Yeah. Yes. The answer to that question is, is yes. Um, I mean, Drupal uh, core takes a lot of time and effort to make sure that pretty much everything that goes into core has tests attached to it. Not every contrib module does, but most do. Um, no, nah, I wouldn't say most, many do. Um, it's definitely good practice and it's gonna prevent the bugs from, you know, obviously from resurfacing later on, or at least help prevent that. Um, so very quickly, I'm just gonna go to, uh, I don't know, views. And if you need to uh, add a, a, a feature request or a bug report, one thing to just keep in mind, the first thing they have at the top here is a search box. This is so that we don't um, submit duplicates as much as possible. The first thing you should do before submitting a bug report is search around and see if somebody's already done it. Maybe there's a fix already. Maybe the patch has already been included and you just need to update to the latest version of the module. Um, but if not, you're gonna open the issues right here. Here, all open issues. And then, oh, I'm not logged in. I'm gonna log in real quick. Um, I always get nervous that I forget to tab during a presentation. Everyone's gonna see my password. Um, and then submitting an issue is fairly straightforward. What version of the module are you using? Is this part of a specific component? Not every module has such detailed components. Um, most of them have just kind of its code or its documentation or it's something like that. Um, bug report, task, feature request, support. Task is kind of the amorphous catch-all. I don't know which one of these this is, so I'll choose task. Um, and then priority, um, who's assigned. Usually you can only pick yourself unless you are the maintainer of the module. And then finally, what's the status of this, right? Um, this will go back and forth 25 times during the course of an issue. Uh, between being reviewed and tested, or being needs work, or there's a patch, or I'm not gonna fix it, um, things of that nature. And then just be as detailed as you can in your description over here, right? Pretty straightforward. So let's keep going. Ooh. I don't like Keynote, I've decided. So yeah, so I'm a new dad, so I have gratuitously cute photos of my kid. Um, there he is, yeah. Uh, quick question on the, the don't be angry. Um, I've had issues where I've submitted patches for things, and So in that, in that situation, so the question was basically, hey, maybe there's a patch sitting in an issue for, for a really long time and nobody's, nobody's uh, updating it, nobody's looking at it. What do you do in that situation? 
Um, typically what I would do there is um, you know, leave a comment, say, hey, has there been any updates to this issue? Give people a reasonable amount of time to respond to that. And if nobody does, um, I may go in IRC um, and see if the maintainer is in IRC and ask them, hey, you know, has anyone looked at this issue? But again, I, I don't go into IRC and say, hey, you have to fix this issue. Right? It's breaking my site. That's, it's just never going to get done that way, and people are never going to kind of respond to you that way. Um, at the end of the day, if nobody responds, um, there's a couple options. You can, you know, if you want to take over the responsibility of that module, um, that's, that's something you can request by opening an issue in that module, saying, hey, it doesn't look like anyone's being very responsive. See this issue where no one's responding. Um, I'd like to become a maintainer or a co-maintainer of this module, maybe move things along. That's an absolutely, totally, you know, a uh, reasonable thing to request if you feel comfortable with that. Um, and then failing that, you know, patch the module. And you have a module that you've patched and you have to unfortunately keep track of that as you go. Um, okay, triaging, triaging issues. Um, so one question uh, that a lot of the core maintainers in particular uh, have whenever new issues pop up, but this is also true for contrib maintainers, is, hey, I see there's a new issue that someone put up there today. Wasn't, didn't I see that issue three days ago or three weeks ago or three years ago? And wasn't that related to something else? And isn't that a duplicate? And I don't remember what's going on. Um, and they can certainly take the time and start looking through um, all of the issues and see if they can't find the related one. If they happen to know the one right then and there, that's terrific. But if not, you take someone like, uh, you know, like Tim Plunkett, who is committing, you know, 400 commits to, to Drupal core every couple days. I'd rather he spend his time working on core than searching through the issue queue um, and, and figuring out whether that's a duplicate or not. Um, so triaging issues helps out a lot. Um, a couple things to keep in mind when you do it is, can you confirm the issue, right? If someone puts a bug report and says, hey, it doesn't work when I click, you know, the foo button, I thought it was supposed to do something, try it, right? Install that, you know, Drupal, Drupal 8 on your local machine and give it a shot. Um, if you can confirm it, great. Comment on that issue saying, I can confirm this, right? If you can't confirm it, say, comment on an issue and say, I can't reproduce this, right? Both of those pieces of information are equally valuable. Um, and the, there's a, a link on drupal.org that makes it a lot easier to, to kind of participate this way. And whoop, there I am. If you go to your dashboard, obviously you have to be logged in for this. If you go to your dashboard, you have this uh, add a block right here. And if you add a block, one of the blocks you can add is called contributor links right here. And this is incredibly useful for a lot of stuff if you're going to be contributing. Um, the, the queues right here are particularly valuable for Drupal core development, um, but they also include some, you know, the contrib issues. Um, many of them do, at least. Uh, but this one right here is issues needing triage. If you actually go there, it's, it's the same list of all of the issues that are open for Drupal.org, um, uh, on Drupal.org, I should say. But it's one, it's sorted by replies, right, where zero is on top. So every one of these issues on here have zero replies, which means no one has looked at them or no one has looked at them and felt it necessary to comment on them. Um, if you scroll down and we go to the ninth page, there is still not one with a reply. If you go to the 13th page, there is still not one with a reply. I, believe, I looked the other day, and I think it was 16, where we started to actually get reply. Yeah, ones with one reply. So that means that there's somewhere between 13 and 16 pages of issues that have never really been looked at. And some of them might be really critical, and the person you know, putting the issue in to the issue queue just wasn't aware that how critical it was. Some of them could be you know, killed right away. Oh, this is a duplicate. We fixed this last week, that sort of a thing. So you know, triaging issues is, is as easy in terms of kind of the process as picking one, right? Hey, the update hook help for comment module. Um, all right, there's an issue that's a task for Drupal core and you know, it was opened by uh, IFRIC and here's a quick background. Hey, this, this issue is part of a meta task and I'm gonna talk about meta tasks and or meta issues in a, in a minute. Um, and we need to, you know, review the, the hook help uh, for, what module was this? The comment module. Um, okay, this isn't a bug, so it's not to say whether or not this is reproducible, right? That's not a, a, a valid um, way to triage this particular issue, but it's totally valid to sit here and say, um, oh, somebody already did this, 
right? That happens from time to time. Or, um, you know, this is something that's probably good. You might want to tag this as novice if it hasn't been tagged that way already. Um, if we feel that this is something that somebody who's new could handle. Um, just that simple act makes it much easier for someone who's coming into the community to say, all right, I want to try something. I want to, you know, I want to figure something out. I'll look at these novice issues. And again, novice issues. If you go to your contributor links, there's a nice, uh, there it is, novice issues link. Um, you know, so, you know, simply by the act of, of triaging these issues, we're really kind of setting the table for people who want to do um, code contributions or review code or write documentation uh, within the code, things of that nature. That might be you, that might not be you, right? This is not necessarily, um, you know, this idea of being a contributor is not necessarily just for people who write code. It's not just for developers. Everybody in this room can, you know, accomplish some of these tasks. Um, very few people can accomplish all of these tasks. Um, so bear that in mind. Okay, let's keep going. Do, do, do. Um, mentoring. So a uh, year and a half, two years ago? Maybe not that long. Um, and there's an initiative that was started by a couple of members of the Drupal community for, for mentoring uh, new folks who are coming into the community, people who are trying to kind of take the step from going from, you know, I'm, I'm really novice at this to I want to be a little bit more involved. Um, and how do we kind of climb the ladder? Everybody's, and I hope everybody at this point has either seen that, that ridiculous cartoon about the Drupal learning curve, right, where you climb up the cliff and the cliff, you just keep going and it starts to come around this way. Um, the Drupal learning curve is that daunting, right? For those of you who have been in the community for a little while, you may kind of already have gotten over some of that. Um, but for those people who are coming in for the first time, it, it can be a big challenge. So having people who are there regularly um, helps considerably. Um, so mentoring, there's a couple things you can do to mentor. Um, it's, not, you know, it's not just the Drupal mentoring program, which I'm going to you know, show you that site in just a second. You can go right on IRC and answer questions, right? That is mentoring. There's no, um, there's no um, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? There's no formal process that you have to go through in order to mentor someone. If you spend 10 minutes um, you know, in your afternoon or something in, in Drupal or Drupal support or something like that in IRC, then you're helping someone out. You, know, you answered that one or two questions, that's great. You're helping that person get to the next level. Um, if you don't know about IRC or don't know how to get on IRC, there's a great page on Drupal.org, Drupal.org slash IRC, which kind of explains how to get on there and, and what to do. Um, again, when you're on IRC, be nice. Right? And it pains me that I have to like, kind of repeat that at every uh, camp that I go to and I give a talk like this or, or every conference, but you'd be amazed. Some people come on and they're just nasty and there's no reason for it. And you're just not gonna get you know, good responses if you're not kind to other people. Um, another thing that you can do, and we've done this in the New York group, um, we started a newbie boff, right? So at every New York meetup, which is uh, once a month, we have somebody from the community who's fairly senior in the community go to a separate room off to the side and just, they started a newbie boff. So anyone who's there at that Drupal meetup who is either new to Drupal, doesn't understand exactly what Drupal is, um, or they're there because they have a very specific question and it's not really appropriate in a room full of 75 people to be like, on my site, I get this error, but only on Tuesdays. Um, that sort of a thing uh, you know, can be a little bit of a challenge with that many people in the room. So we do that newbie buff. Great way to help mentor people, great way to help move people up from being you know, brand new to this to I'm a novice, I'm a novice to I'm, I'm kind of at that intermediate step. Um, and we definitely have people who now run the newbie buff who were in the newbie buff at one point. Um, and that's, you know, that makes us feel all warm and fuzzy inside, so that's a great thing to do. Um, Drupal Mentoring, so I, I talked about this a little earlier. Um, Drupal Mentoring is a great site that was set up by, um, by Jess and Kathy and Andrea and a couple other people, I think. Tim and, and Tim Plunkett, yeah. Um, basically the idea is that people who are a little more senior in the community are going through and taking note of issues that are appropriate for people who are at various levels of getting started in the community and they flag them as such and they break them down into very you know, specific tasks and, uh, and then they have uh, office hours in IRC um, two or three times a week depending on what's going on 
And if you come into the office hours and say, hey, I want to help, I do not know how to get started, someone that will be there during those designated times that is very specifically there to respond to a person exactly like that. Um, and they'll point you to DrupalMentoring.org and they'll help you assign you know, a task to yourself. And those tasks can be as simple as triaging issues or as simple as summarizing an issue or as complex as, you know, write this hook for Drupal 8. Um, you know, they, they kind of span the range of, of all the things. Um, that you might be interested in doing. So that's a, a terrific way of getting involved um, for the people who want to become contributors, and it's a terrific way to get involved for those of you who already feel like you're a little bit more senior and you want to help others become a contributor. Um, that's a terrific way to do it, so I highly recommend doing that. Um, Friday, this Friday, there is a kind of mentoring day, um, a mentoring sprint where the mentors will be around in their yellow t-shirts, so come to that. Um, if you want to be a mentor, talk to Kathy. <laughs> um, and you know, it's, it's really you know, terrific to help out the people who are just getting started on Friday. Um, okay, the next thing you can do, and now we're gonna start to get a little bit more into code. So for those of you who aren't coders, a lot of the stuff that you can kind of do to contribute, we've covered. For those of you who are writing code, this is where we're gonna start to get into that a little bit. Um, so reviewing a patch, there's a couple ways that you can review a patch. Um, first is reviewing a patch for style, gotchas, and strategy. Now what I mean by this is, let's just do it, let's go there. Um, so, do do do, did I miss it? No, there it is. Um, if I go to, I think it's this one, yes, no. There we go, okay. So this is a module that I'm a maintainer of. It's called Representative Image. It's a great module. It's terrific, you should definitely download it and try it out. Um, it helps you with that problem of, hey, my content type has 12 different image fields and I want a view, but I want to pick which image field is the representative image for that content type so that that's the, only, the one that always shows up. Anyway, um, that's me plugging the module. So if you come to an issue where you have um, a patch like this, right? I can click on this patch and I can actually start looking through this patch. It's a little bit harder to see on, on, the, uh, on the board here. But I can start looking through this patch and seeing, oh, okay, um, you'll have to take my word for it that these are pluses on the side and there are some minuses down here. Um, oh, this person is adding this bit of code and taking away this bit of code. Um, from the style point of view, hey, they're not using Drupal coding standards. I don't need to apply this patch to my code to know that. I can look at it you know, once I'm more familiar with that. I can look at it and say, oh, you, you know, you're supposed to have a comma at the end of you know, the last thing in an array. You don't have that, and I can comment on that. Um, I can look at this and say, from a, from a strategic point of view, why are you, you know, um, you're using a function in here from the views module, but there's no dependency on the views module. Well, that's strategically a bad idea because someone might install this module, the representative image module, but not have views installed, and then this will explode, right? I don't need to actually install this to figure that out. I can just know. Um, the other thing that uh, you, know, you might see are, hey, you know, this needs tests, right? And you might just comment in the issue, hey, this is a great patch as far as I can tell so far, but there's no tests and this definitely needs tests because um, you're fixing an error. And almost always when you're fixing an error, you need tests. Um, this is a kind of a crappy way to look at these, if you, if, you know, even, even if you could see the pluses and minuses. So um, somebody came up with, I think it was Sun and someone else came up with a tool that I'm gonna show you to make this way more better in terms of reviewing. So now that I have some internets, hopefully you still have that. Um, I was in incognito mode over there so that you didn't see that I had this thing. I'm gonna show you how to get this thing. But you'll notice I'm on the same page, but I've now got this lovely little review button down here. I also have this even lovelier little simply test me button. I'm gonna talk about both of those. So the patch we were just looking at is this one right here. If I click review, oh, this is so much easier to read because it's color coded, right? Red things are deleted and green things are added. Um, what else can I do in here? Well, let's say that I wanna leave a comment. This is, you know, it's not the biggest patch in the world, but there's some stuff going on here. But let's say I wanted to leave a comment specifically about this line and this line. I can highlight those two lines and I get this box over here and say, what is this for? I don't understand. Whatever the comment is, right? This is kind of uh, just demonstrative, but all right. And I can save that. And then I can come down here and I could say on this line, oh, 
don't delete that var. We need that later. All right, so I've kind of gone through and I'm, I'm reviewing this particular patch. Again, right now I'm only reviewing because I haven't applied the patch. I'm only reviewing for style and for gotchas and, and strategy. So I save that, save, and once I'm done, I can click paste. Now, if you look at this guy, I can see that, and I'm gonna preview it because it's easier to see. I'm gonna preview this comment. I can see that, hey, the thing I highlighted is in here, in a code tag, all ready for me, with my comment. Same with the second one, same with the third one. It makes reviewing uh, patches so much easier. So this tool that I've been using is called Dreaditor, all right? And you can get it, there's a new site called, I forget what it's called, it's called, it is called Dreaditor, Dreaditor.org, there you go. Um, that's where you can get it. It's available for Chrome and for Firefox. If you're using Firefox, you need another extension for Firefox called WebMonkey, um, but it's pretty easy to install. Um, so I highly, 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 highly recommend using Dreaditor. There's also a bunch of other tools that Dreaditor gives you to make this issues page a lot more usable. Um, and I'll just go through those really quick. Uh, if you are the maintainer of a module, for example, oh, I'm not on the issue page anymore, I want to comment preview. If you're the maintainer of a module and you have, um, you have uh, Dreaditor installed, you get this create commit message button down here, right? So I can create the commit message. It'll put a link to every name of every person that submitted a patch and I can click, oh, Alberto is the one who really did most of the work on this and I can copy that commit message and it will make sure that it's in the, you know, kind of the, the appropriate uh, format for git commits that, um, you know, that are expected on drupal.org. And it gives credit to the person who did you know, the, the chunk of the work. Um, notice that it gives credit in two places, right? It has everybody's name who appears in these buttons separated by a comma. And then it has the author, you know, in git only allows one value. So that's kind of what you're picking there. Um, so that's incredibly useful. Making this sticky is incredibly useful, especially on a long issue. Right? I could be typing and say, oh, in comment number 127, so-and-so said such-and-such, but in comment number 283, such-and-such said something else. Um, other things it'll do, if you're, you know, let's say that that is the comment that you're doing, right? What about comment three, and I'm, or number three, rather, number three, and I hit tab, it makes a link directly to that comment. All right? So there's tons of kind of little hidden gems in Dreaditor that make going through the issue queue much, much, much easier. Going back to our summarizing the issue, you know, when you say, hey, what are the proposed resolutions? Well, wouldn't it be great to say one pro proposed resolution was resolution A and one was resolution B, link directly to those two comments, especially if it's a nice, big, long issue. It makes it easier for everybody. Um, and there's really no extra work to do it if you're using something like this. Um, I can make this unsticky. Um, clone an issue. If there's an issue out there that's pretty close to what you wanted, um, not, it's not going to include the comments, but including kind of all the metadata up here at the top. Um, clone it and just change the one little piece that you wanted to change. Um, I personally haven't found this totally useful yet because if it's that close, then you probably want to just stick to this issue, but it's, it's new and it's there. The last thing I want to talk about, and I, I pointed to this, is this simply test me. Simply test me is phenomenal, all right? If you want to actually review a patch, including the code and functionality of it, but you don't really have a local dev environment and you're not really set up, this is a great way to do it. If I click simply test me, and hopefully internet don't fail me now, um, it's gonna say, hey, what project are you testing? What version of Drupal are we talking about? Do you wanna make sure there are any other modules installed at the time you test it, right? Maybe, that, maybe a representative image that doesn't depend on views, but it has some stuff that uses views, so maybe I wanna, you know, add views, and it'll give me a list and say, oh, there it is, okay. And are there any patches to apply? Well, by, you know, by default, it puts that in there, Dreaditor puts that in there for me. Um, and I can add another patch if, like, this was an issue that also requires a patch for core um, to make this all work. I can add two or three patches, and I click Launch Sandbox. And then I wait for about 10 minutes. Um, it's not really 10 minutes. Let's see. Oh, look at it doing much better today than I was a couple days ago. Um, but anyway, I'll let that go for a few minutes. Um, and what'll end up happening is I'll have a fully functioning vanilla Drupal site with nothing installed except vanilla Drupal, rep uh, representative image, and views that I can now click around in and test it. It's fantastic. 
Um, so Simply Test Me is a, is a hugely, hugely helpful tool. It just came around maybe three or four months ago. Um, and it's kind of, in my opinion, it's, it's really revolutionized a lot of the testing that you can do. Um, okay, so that, well, let's see if it's in there yet. Oh, it's so close. It's close enough to taste. There we go. Okay, so it plops in my admin and my password. I can log in and I'm going to escape out of my little one password thing. And I can see under configuration and under media, where the hell are you? Where are you? Where's media? Oh, there it is. There's my representative images you know, link for configuration. And I can now go through this and say, oh, I want to play with this path, with this patch and actually adds this path um, option down here. And I'm going to try it out and, and see if it works and comment back on the issue accordingly. Um, if you want to do it a little bit, you know, have finer tune control and do it a little bit old school, you can um, you know, apply the patch using normal get tools. So I'm going to show that real quick. Um, this is a little bit too zoomed in. Is that still readable for the most part? Whoops. Uh, OK, so I am in my local Drupal 7 site. And let's assume I downloaded that patch to my desktop. right? In order to apply it in Git, it's very simple. Git apply, and then the path to the patch. So this patch is called, rep I'm gonna actually do the comment. I have a different patch on the desktop. I kind of put everything there because the internet wasn't working earlier. So I had to run back to the hotel and download everything so that if the internet wasn't working during this, I could still demo things. Um, and that's not how you spell apply at all. Git Apple is not gonna do anything at all. <laughs> all right. So there we go, git apply. So I downloaded that patch to my desktop and I did git apply and it says, oh, okay, um, we applied it. Quick warning, it applied it after fixing a little white space error that I must have had in the patch. Maybe I used tabs instead of spaces. That's no good and I have my git set up to yell at me when I do that. Um, and now if I do git status, status, um, there we go. I've modified, you know, this one uh, file is modified here and if I do git diff, then I can see, oh, what am I fixing here? Uh, it's probably really hard to see it, but implements is spelled wrong, right? Implements should be spelled correctly, so that fixes it. If I scroll down a little bit, um, where's my, uh, this comment was um, somehow inadequate, right? Long, so, what's that? Too long should it be, should it, should it be one line? It should, well, it should be one line. Um, the, the general rule of thumb is 80 characters, and I'm just so zoomed in that um, you can't tell that I'm, I'm behaving, and I am at 80 characters, so that's pretty good. Um, I didn't have the type on the, uh, on the parameter in my comment, right? I should say object or string or whatever type that can, uh, can accept, and so on. So I can keep going down, and all of these are basically just issues with the comments, all right? So I'm just going to quit out of that, and we're going to actually kind of go through the process right now of opening an issue, submitting a patch, and then assuming you are the contributor, we're gonna review the patch, accept the patch, and commit the patch, all right? So let's just go through that whole process, which kind of runs the gambit. You know, if you're, if you're new to all this, you probably only do the first couple of these steps. If you're getting more and more advanced, you'll do the last couple of these steps. So I'm gonna go back to that, uh, 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 there it is, representative images. Oh, no, that's not it. That's our little fake site. I'm just going to go to representative images. Representative. Am I spelling it right? Representative image. There we go. And we're going to assume I already looked through to see if anyone has, you know, uh, opened an issue saying, hey, all the comments need to be cleaned up. And no one has. So I create a new issue. This is for version... 7.1, uh, 7x, 1x dev, which is kind of uh, head. Um, this is a documentation problem. Category is a bug fix or a bug report. Um, this could also be a task, really, right? Clean up the, the, uh, uh, the comments. And priority is definitely critical. No, priority is minor. And I'm going to say clean up um, uh, comments. A bunch of the comments don't meet the Drupal coding standards. We should fix that, right? Always be nice. Have a nice day. Okay, 
All right, I can't type today. It's hard to type when you're looking behind you. Um, and I'm gonna open this issue. So there we go. So we've opened a new issue. There's this issue. And that's pretty good. We've opened our issue. So let's actually submit our patch. To do that, I'm gonna choose a file and on my desktop. Now, of course, the assumption here is that I've made all the changes and I've tested them locally, right? Um, the module maintainers in particular get kind of frustrated when someone throws up a nice big patch there having never tested it and then the module maintainer applies the patch and just everything explodes all of a sudden. Um, so make sure that you're testing what you're doing. In our case, it's just comments so you can't really break anything with comments. Um, but here's my patch. So I can attach that file and I can say, here we go. Made a patch to fix this. Fix this. And apparently I have Scrum in 30 minutes. Um, and I'm gonna save that comment. But I forgot something, all right? There's a very key, um, I don't even know the word I'm looking for, but there's a, there's a key step that I forgot, which is whenever you submit a patch, always, all the time, without exception, if you submit, well, that's not true, there are exceptions, but they're really rare. Um, if you submit a patch, you always wanna set this to needs review. Um, the reason for doing that is because if you upload a file the way, did I not actually hit submit? Where'd my comment go? Sometimes you just have to wait like two minutes and then reload the email. It'll come through. Let's reload and see what happens. There it is. Okay. Um, but like I said, if, you know, I forgot to do uh, needs review. If you upload a file called dot .patch, anything dot .patch, and you set the status to needs review, then Drupal's test bot will come along and see that issue and it will run through all of the simple tests um, necessary. If it's a contrib module, not, like I said, not every contrib module has tests. They should. If you're going to be writing your own contrib module, you should be having simple tests. And you can um, set up on Drupal.org your project to run those simple tests. Um, but core, every patch that gets um, submitted for core, that every file that ends in patch, when you set it to needs review, it's going to run through all, what, like 45,000 tests that exist in core now, some ridiculous number. Um, it takes a few minutes. Uh, sometimes it could take as much as like half an hour, 45 minutes. Um, but if you, so we want to do this. I'm going to do need set review. Whoop. Forgot to set for review. Here, test bot. And I save it. What's going to happen once it saves is, and I'll refresh real quick, is... Oh, it didn't do, oh, there it is. Queued for testing, right? It took a second. Now it's queued for testing. Once TestBot comes along and like decides, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through the test, this is gonna turn yellow. And then once TestBot comes along and says, all right, you passed all your tests, it will turn green. If you fail the test, it'll turn red and give you a little link saying, you know, here's some more details about what failed. The details about what failed aren't, you know, it's not like it says, oh, line 72, you screwed that up. Um, they're not, as helpful as one would hope, but they at least tell you this test failed. And you can look at the code for that test and say, oh, well, what it's trying to do here is make sure that I can save a node and it's not letting me save a node. Let's try and you know, go through that process manually on my local development machine and see if I can have that same break happen. And then if I can, great, I can fix it. If I can't, then I'm gonna start to maybe go into IRC and ask questions or talk to other people um, and see if I can't figure out what might be going on. Uh, from time to time, TestBot goes on vacation. Um, if that happens, try again the next day um, it, or a couple hours later. Um, TestBot is a, is a fickle friend uh, and doesn't always work. But I'd say, I'd say 51 weeks of the year, TestBot is great. Uh, but there's that one week scattered throughout that's pretty, pretty terrible. Um, okay, so now what, we've, what have we done? We've opened an issue. We've submitted a patch for it. Let's now kind of go to the flip side. And now you're the module maintainer, right? You're the contributor. Um, this is your contrib module. Well, let's, let's review it, all right? So I come onto this issue and I say, oh, someone has opened an issue and given me a patch. Let's take a look. All right, so we fixed some comments here. That looks good. We fixed some comments here. Um, one, another good thing about Dreaditor, and I don't know if I have any examples of it, I hopefully don't, is if you, for example, have tabs in here instead of spaces, or if you have an extra space at the end of your line, Dreaditor will actually like blink it, you know, blink it, but like make it bright red. 
um, indicating, hey, you have a little bit of a, a coding standard problem there. Definitely doesn't catch everything, but whatever it can catch, it tells you about, which is really nice, especially as, as the maintainer. Um, so I'm gonna look through this and I'm gonna see, all right, this looks great or this doesn't look great. Um, and actually, this is a problem. This shouldn't be in here. This is not a comment fix, right? So when I made my patch, I screwed that up a little bit. So, right, this is not a comment fix. That belongs in another issue, whatever it is. Probably belongs in another issue, right? So I can save that. And what I'll do, I'll go through the process right now. And I will, here's the code in question. I am going to, that was actually, well, what was that problem? Let me look again. Oh, really, all this was, was it was actually just a white space problem, if I look a little bit closer. But just for the sake of argument, let's just change it around just to see what happens. Um, so there's right to, what line was that? Line 189. So, oh, there we go. Oh, that's actually the problem. There's a tab in there. Don't know why that was there. So let's actually just save this. And I'm going to do get diff. And I'll see that should go away. Yeah, it's not in there anymore as part of this get diff. Oh, no, it is in there. Hmm. All right. Well, let's see what happens here. Um, I'm going to quit. I'm gonna do git diff, and this is how you create a patch if you haven't created a patch before. Um, you make sure that whatever contrib module, or if it's core, it's core, um, that you've checked it out using git. All right, that's the easiest way by far to create a patch. Um, so I'm in the actual representative image folder. I'm gonna do git diff, and I just do a greater than sign, and then the name of the file. So desktop, and then it is represented, whoops, rep image comments.patch, so I'm overriding that. And now I'm gonna go back to, um, go back to this issue and say, oops, I don't wanna cancel, I wanna paste, because I had made a comment in there. And I'll save, right? Now you'll notice, magically, oh, it's not magically. Doesn't this usually put it back to needs work? Oh, I thought it did. Only if it fails the test, thank you. All right, so I should have set this to needs work, right, as the module maintainer now. So I'll save that and set it to needs work. And now, as the person actually doing the contributing, I'm gonna say, oh, I fixed it, right? Whenever you upload a patch, you wanna set this back to needs review and say, I fixed that issue you found in number four tab, and it puts the link right in there. Are we allowed to heckle? Yes, you can heckle. Okay, that was actually, you get the comment that identified the problem was actually in the Da! Forded. Yes, that's absolutely right, so. And you didn't upload an interdiff. And I didn't upload an interdiff. Okay, I was gonna go into interdiffs, but I'm glad that you brought it up. So interdiffs, are especially, especially, especially with big patches, are really important, all right? Imagine I, I upload a patch that is, you know, 5K, 500 lines of, of, well, 5K is not 500 lines, but whatever. 500 lines of changes, and somebody comes along and says, hey, there was a, you know, a spelling mistake, or there's this one little thing you need to change. Well, the person who has gone through the effort of reviewing that initial patch um, does not want to go through the effort of reviewing the entire patch again just to confirm that I've fixed that one minor change that they wanted to make. Um, just for time's sake, I'm not gonna go through the process right now. Sorry, Kathy. But um, it's not too hard, and there's a great post on, uh, on Drupal.org. If you just do Drupal interdiff, you'll, I promise you'll, you'll get it right there. Um, but basically what it does is it allows you to upload two separate files. One is the big, huge patch with just your little tiny extra change that you made. And the other is, looks very similar, right? It looks like one of these, but it only shows, shows the changes from the previous patch, you know, as long as you did it right. So that way you can see, oh, he just fixed the spelling mistake that I told him to, excellent. Now I don't need to review this entire patch again. Um, so those, that can be very, very helpful. Uh, okay, so now let's actually go back in there, let's review this again. And sure enough, I don't know why it's still in there. I don't know what keeps screwing with that. But let's pretend for, what's that? Yeah, 
But it shouldn't have been like that to begin with. I don't know. Um, anyway, I don't want to kind of get bogged down on, on a little thing like that during, during this. But basic idea here is as the maintainer again, I'm putting on my, my module maintainer hat, um, I can actually sit there and say, oh, okay, this patch is excellent. And I've tested it by applying it locally, right? Which I, you know, I downloaded it and applied it the same way. And I could say, git uh, add minus a. So add, actually let's just do git status first and double check. You always wanna do git status before you do git add for those of you who you know, are fairly new to git. Um, Cause you wanna make sure you're not accidentally adding some other wackity files that had nothing to do with this change. And I'm not, so I'm gonna do git add minus a. Um, I could also just do git add and specify the file that I wanna add. And now I could do git commit minus m and start writing out that big long message. Or I can go back to here and create the commit message, say that I fixed it, uh, copy this, and whoops, and go back into my terminal and paste it. Now I've committed it, and I can do git push origin. Now I'm not gonna do it because I wanna figure out why I, what, I messed up with that little space there. But if I were to do git push origin, that's it. It's done, almost, right? The code is there. It's done with respect to the code. What isn't there, however, is an update to this issue. That's the last thing as a maintainer you wanna make sure you always do, is come back to the issue, say thank you so much to whoever it was that submitted the code, right? If it was you, you can pat yourself on the back, that's fine. Um, but you know, usually, or, or hopefully, it was someone else who was helping you out. Um, but you wanna set this to fixed, right? You wanna set this issue to fixed. And the other thing you wanna do is you wanna say, hey, I fixed this, here's a link to that commit, okay? And the way to get that link, the, the way that I always do it, I feel like there must be another way to do this, but I open up the project page in another tab, and down here on the side is a repository viewer and a view commits link. So if I click the view commits, I will see all the commits that I pushed up to origin from wherever I pushed them up. So let's assume, for example, that this was my most recent commit. I click on it, and I can just copy this URL right here. But just very quickly to look through, what do you get in here? Well, you get information about you know, what was the parent commit and all that kind of you know, uh, git, um, those git details. But you also can look at the commit diff uh, and see what changed in the last commit. Right? In the last commit, I guess we added this comment here uh, and this comment here and so on. Um, and I can look at the tree and I can look at the log, I can look at the short log, right? The short log is just a, a list of the commits very briefly. Um, this is really, really useful, um, especially if you want to send information about the Git repository to someone else, right? For the most part, this is all information. If you have the Git repository cloned locally, you can just get, excuse me, using Git. But if you don't, or you want to point someone to a specific commit or a specific comment in a commit, something like that, this is really super helpful. So I come down to here and um, I would say, you know, thanks a ton, exclamations. Um, you know, this is committed. And I would set it to fixed, submit the, uh, the form, and now I'm done. All right, so that's kind of the whole life cycle of someone identified a problem, someone wrote the patch, somebody reviewed the patch, I screwed up the patch. So somebody wrote another patch. It's still screwed up, but we're gonna pretend it's not. I reviewed the patch, right? And it doesn't have to be the core maintainer who does most of the reviewing, um, or, the, uh, or the contrib maintainer, the module maintainer. Typically they will, right, before they put it in, hopefully at least give it a, a good looking at, but um, often, module, uh, often issues get uh, back and forth and back and forth between reviewer and the person writing the code, and it's not the module maintainer. Um, and then we committed it and we uh, closed out the issue. So that's the entire kind of workflow for that process. So I'm gonna keep going. Okay, so the next thing that you can do, uh, you can write your own contrib module. Uh, I'm not going to go through and demonstrate the process of writing an entire contrib module because that will take a really long time. But what I do wanna talk about is a couple of things to keep in mind. The first thing is, before you write your own contrib module, ask yourself if a module already exists for that particular problem. Even if there's one that's close, right? Better to work with a module that already exists that gets you 90% of the way there than creating your own. The last thing that we wanna have on Drupal.org is 75 different modules that print out a debug statement, right? 
Devel does that pretty well. Can it be improved? Absolutely. But do we need another module that does basically the same thing? Not really, right? So ask yourself if that module already exists somewhere, right? If it does, try and work with that module maintainer. Try and get your changes that you need into that module. Um, but if it doesn't, and you've come up you know, with a totally new problem that hasn't really been solved in Drupal, you should create a sandbox project, all right? Creating a sandbox project is pretty straightforward. If you go to drupal.org um, slash, oh wait, I had the link in there. I forgot the exact link. Doo -doo -doo. Oh, eh, silly thing. Uh, drupal.org slash, uh, actually the way I did to get to it, because I had the link pasted in there, but apparently Keynote doesn't let me actually click on a link. Um, is I go to my dashboard and I click on your projects and there's a nice little link right at the bottom here which is add a new project. All right, when you're adding a new project, you know, is it a module, is it a theme and so on, um, it asks you a couple questions about it, you know, are you actively maintaining it or, you know, so on. You give it a title and you give it a description and then there's this sandbox check, you know, checkbox. A sandbox project for those who don't know, um, anyone on Drupal.org can create a sandbox project at any time. It's a great way to start getting your module going, all right? There's no reason to have a full-on project that people are downloading everywhere um, with like half-written code and 10,000 to-dos you know, written in there. You really wanna kind of flesh out your ideas a little bit first, but you still want a place to host it so that you can collaborate with other, you know, other Drupal uh, developers uh, so you can get opinions on the code so that you can have people try it out. Um, some people are more conservative than others with when they'll kind of cross that threshold and say, this is no longer a sandbox project. This is a real project and it should have a name like views um, or, or admin menu or something more you know, exciting than that. Um, you need to apply for full project maintainer status before you can make that switch from a sandbox project to a full project. And in order to do that, um, you can just go to, I have this open in the screen. You can go to, oh my stupid, thing here, da, da, da. no, that's not it, here it is. Um, project, drupal.org slash project slash project applications. And there's all sorts of details here about what you need to do. Helpful hint, all right? There is a program that basically allows you um, to kind of get your project a little bit higher in the priority list as people are reviewing before deciding whether to allow you to make it a full project. Um, and if you go through and you evaluate other people's applications for full project status and say, hey, this is a great idea, or hey, this is exactly the same as views, why are we creating another module for that? Um, or hey, your code is really terrific, I, I'm really a fan, something like that. Um, if you go through and, and you uh, review other people's, um, and notice there are 234 open issues on this project. Um, those are all people applying to get project maintainer status. Um, then the people who are authorized to actually give you that right, that permission, permission will kind of kick you up the line and, and look at yours uh, a lot sooner. So if you're really, really eager to get that project maintainer status, go ahead and, and review three or four other people and you'll kind of you know, kick your, kick your uh, chances in gear. Um, so that is uh, what you need to do in order to get a new project. Um, that's the reviewer bonus program that I was talking about. And I already went through that. Um, don't forget to maintain your modules. I know that sounds silly, but you'd be amazed at how many people create a new project, you know, get really excited about it for a week, commit tons of code, and then that's it. They're, you know, they leave and they, they never um, kind of look at the issue queue. They never look at um, you know, people making feature requests, people offering up their own code and, and submitting patches. Uh, and that's kind of unfortunate. Um, so, one more slide and then I'm gonna uh, open the, the, uh, the door to questions. So the last thing, and this is probably what you know, most people kind of consider being a contributor, but like I said before, all the different steps we've gone through, all the different things that we've discussed really are, in my opinion, you know, attributes of being a contributor to Drupal, every one of them. Um, but the last one is, is actually creating your own patch to either a contrib module or to, uh, to core. Um, I'm not gonna go through that process because it's the same um, as uh, I'm not going to do it through the core patch creating process because it really is the same as creating a patch for um, a contrib module. Um, but a couple things to keep in mind. This is actually the solution to 
and hopefully you've all heard this at least 300 times while you've been here, not, don't hack core, right? Um, the solution to that is to create your own patch and submit it to that contrib module or to core, right? By submitting it, you have at the very least opened up in a, in a formal, kind of easy to find location, a summary of the problem and a, and a, and a suggestion for the solution. We have, at my, in my team, we have a rule where every once in a while you do come across something in a contrib module or in Drupal core where you really do make, need to make a change. So our rule, and this is true of our entire organization, is basically before you are allowed to make that change, you must have opened an issue on drupal.org for that change, and you must submit a patch back when appropriate. Um, the reason for this is there's no reason you should ever be you know, making a change to Drupal core or to a contrib module unless there's either a bug or a feature that you need that isn't there. And in both of those cases, that patch should live on drupal.org. There's a bunch of reasons for that. Someone else will review it, right? Always having an extra pair of eyes is good. Um, the maintainer may come along and say, oh, that's not really a problem, you're just doing it wrong, right? Here's a, here's a solution that you can use without having to you know, change any code. Um, someone may come along and say, oh, there's a security problem with what you just did. Uh, that's gonna be a, a big deal, especially um, if your site is, is using e-commerce or something along those lines. Um, and uh, a couple other quick points, and then I'll just open it to questions. Um, get familiar with the Drupal coding standards, right? Uh, Drupal coding standards are kind of seem nit nitpicky when people, you know, you submit a big long patch that you know solves some big problem, and someone comes along and says you need two spaces instead of tabs. Can get a little bit frustrating, but if you get yourself familiar with that, then you you won't have to deal with it anymore, right? You'll you'll really be able to focus on um, on the problems you're trying to solve. Last point, um, you don't need to solve 100% of a problem in order to submit a patch. Webchick wrote a great blog post. It's kind of a few years old at this point, but she talks about the idea of the person, the one person who sits and writes this big, long patch and takes two, three, four weeks to kind of solve the problem and figure out what they want to do and then submits the patch versus another person who kind of just gets a rough idea and throws it up there that day. By doing the rough idea and throwing it up there that day, you can get immediate feedback and you can save yourself you know, 13 other days of work um, you know, with, with, other, you know uh, with other people looking at your, your quick idea and saying, oh, you're going down the wrong path, try it this way instead. Whereas the person who takes two weeks to do it um, doesn't have that luxury. Um, they, they spent two weeks of doing work and then suddenly, you know, someone comes along and says, oh, we already fixed that, or you went down the totally wrong path and that's not great. Um, so that's basically it. Um, if there are any questions, again, that's me on drupal.org. Um, I'm Blean or Blean18, and I, well, what time is, are we getting close? Yeah, we have five minutes. So if there are any questions, come up to the mic or just shout them out. That's good. Um, yeah. You mentioned uh, that some people just pop on IRC and oh, wait, say. Use the mic. I'll repeat the question, go ahead. Um, it's a fair question. So the question was, um, what happens when kind of the reverse happens on IRC? When you, when you're trying to suggest an idea or or try and get get your patch into a core module, or a core or contrib module, and the, the maintainer doesn't want to hear from you and, and is kind of obnoxious about it. Um, I mean, there's not too much you can do about that other than to you know try and you know ask them nicely if they'll reconsider. Um, other than that, it's, it's really kind of at the, the maintainer's discretion. If it's a core maintainer, you should definitely let some people know about that. Um, I know all the core maintainers to one degree or another, and I can't imagine any of them ever actually doing that. Um, but contrib modules are contrib modules. If it starts to get like really um, inappropriate, that you should, you should kind of find, find someone um, from the either, I guess, the Drupal Association or you know, one of the, the long-standing members of Drupal who you happen to know and ask them what you might be able to do about that. Um, 
Drupal does have a core, a, a code of conduct that you know essentially is be respectful of other people. That you know to summarize it in one sentence. So if someone is really being disrespectful, you know you can kind of call them out on that if you want to go through that process. But in terms of like getting your patch in, there's nothing you can do about getting your patch in if it's their contrib module and they just don't want to hear from you. Um, that's unfortunate. You can, yeah, you can fork their, their, their module. You can offer to be a co-maintainer if, the, if the, the problem really is I just don't have the time for you. Um, you can you know, try and get, if there's more than one maintainer, maybe try and get in touch with one of the other maintainers. Um, but there's, there's not too much you can do about that. Any other questions? Comment? Yep. Uh, how can I contribute to uh, append those module? I mean, if uh, the maintainer doesn't, uh, I can find the maintainer after a few comments and maybe after a few emails, and uh, there's a lot of patches waiting for review, mm -hmm. waiting for commit, commit, and nothing just happens. Like, there's no maintainer at all mm -hmm. the So the question is really what happens when the, the maintainer is just not responsive at all, yeah. and there's a bunch of patches just waiting in the queue, and you, you want to get this module moving along? I think the date module is a great example. It's going on right now. Uh, okay, so, so the date module, yeah, that is a, actually a pretty good example. Um, a couple things can happen. Either someone can step up and say, I, I will help maintain this module. Um, and if you open, if, if the maintainer is not even responding to that request, you can open an issue in the issue queue and say, please make me maintainer. I'd really like to help move this module along. And if it stays open for a you know, reasonable amount of time and nobody, um, nobody responds to it, you can open an issue in the, in the project applications queue and say, hey, I'd really like to help move this module along. Nobody, no maintainer has been responding to my requests. I'd like to take it over. And someone on that team will evaluate you know, the, the situation and if, you know, if they feel it's, it's appropriate then they will make you a maintainer and you end up taking over that module. Um, if, if that's not something you want to take the responsibility for or you don't feel you're at the level to take responsibility for that, um, you, know, you can try and find someone who would be willing to. If you look through the issue queue for that module and you happen to see that there's that one guy or that one girl who's, who's committing or, or uh, uh, uploading patch after patch after patch, mm -hmm. this will be the last question. Um, then maybe that person is a great person to kind of tap and say, you know, no one's been responding. Maybe you want to take the module over. That would be terrific, and you know, you can try and help out that way. Um, really quick before uh, before we get kicked out of here is the the what did you think page, right? Go to the the link here, and if you could fill out the the survey and let us know what you thought, that'd be terrific. That helps me out a lot and helps the the organizers out. And then uh, that's it. Thank you very much. How are you, Kenny? Pretty good. You too. I heard you guys were here. Yeah. Oh. Uh, VGA.